So, when I started getting into ham, I used to think it's funny when you guys were talking about telephony, because my view of wireless telephony is what we're going to show you tonight. It's a little bit different to what you guys uh, normally do. Um, so, by way of introduction to this project, there's a video that I'll show. The video is from the project sponsors, and I think it's probably one of the better ways to illustrate what we'll talk about today. John lives here. He needs to keep in touch with the important people in his life, like his colleague Big Mike, Cabello at the clinic, and of course, Utumi. But John's only option is using his mobile phone. And like most people he knows, he's spending a big chunk of his disposable income on expensive mobile services, and mostly just to talk to people in his village. But that was before the mashed potato. Ah, uh, not that kind. It's a simple Wi-Fi device that connects to other mashed potatoes, forming a network. It lets John make free calls to anyone else in the network using any normal phone. The more potatoes, the larger the network and the more connected the community. All it needs is power. It works anywhere and can be deployed cheaply and hassle-free. The mesh potatoes can also be hooked up with any internet or telecoms provider, letting John and his neighbors access the web and make cheap, long-distance calls. It's a simple DIY telephone company toolkit. No vendor lock-in, no regulatory bottlenecks, and no hidden fees. Village Telco, a communication revolution. So, this project stemmed out of a need, and I think the need is fairly self-explanatory. But, in short, the motivation for this project started in Africa. And for those that are familiar with some of the work the Shuttleworth Foundation have been doing, they're one of the people that helped bankroll this. The development team is global, it's an international effort, and they've used open source techniques, if you will, to get the hardware and get some other bits and pieces out there in the public. So the fact is that the average person spends half their income on mobile phone calls, which is pretty scary when you think about it. Um, despite phones, becoming you know, a very common everyday item out there. They're still very, very expensive. And we whinge about coverage. If you look at some countries, there just isn't any coverage as soon as you step out of the city. So we're well, spending half their salary and they don't have any services. So that was the motivation for this, this project. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk to this? I think you, you liked the slide. Yeah, I just thought it was quite funny that um, <clears throat> Obviously, all this runs on, on license spectrum, the um, 2.4 gigahertz range, so it's pretty much free for all, which brings its other issues, obviously, with congestion and contention. Um, but again, so now that 2.4 gigahertz has been standardised, it's um, pretty much open slow, and the, the cost of the chipset of these things are just dropping every day, so this unit itself retails about $100, and that was a few years ago. Now, they can, they're going to be building a newer unit, which we'll discuss and possibly dropping price a bit, but doubling or triple the functionality <laughs> and adding more features to it as well. So. And on that spectrum note, one of the big issues you've got in these markets is you might have one or two carriers that have the monopoly. They're not opening up any more spectrum. They're not allowing anyone else to build networks. So really, your choice is to use the network that's available, even if it's poor, and that's about it. So these guys are uh, being pretty clever by getting access to bandwidth that typically no one would let them use. So is it just 2.4 gigahertz or what about 5 gigahertz? For the moment it is, we'll touch on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much part of the motivation. So the Wi-Fi thing is pretty cool, it's cheap, it's everywhere. Um, graphs are always pretty and this one illustrates uh, a pretty serious trend. I mean, I think you'd all agree, everything has a Wi-Fi chip in it now. The technology is open, there's no licenses, there's no rules around who can build what. Uh, and it's established. I actually think that's a pretty conservative graph. I mean, how much Wi-Fi stuff are you carrying right now? Everyone's got a phone that's got Wi-Fi, right? You know, touch on what they do in Africa and the fact that mo mobile services end up as a de facto banking system. Well, mobile phone services <laughs> there become yeah, <coughs> a bit of everything, right? And mobile becomes their credit yeah. transfer yeah. mechanism yeah. in yeah. Africa. Pretty much their PayPal in a sense. Yeah. 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 The other thing as well is there's, there's a pretty sizable market sending secondhand phones from the Western world into these <coughs> countries. So, you know, it's great if I can buy a secondhand iPhone. You know, has anyone done any phone recycling before? You send it off. 
these phones get cleaned up and sent off into these countries. But again, if they have to go stick an ex expensive SIM card in it, then what's the point? But if they can start utilising some of these technologies, then that might mean they can get a smartphone with cheap or free access. So, yeah, for Wi-Fi. All right. <laughs> Looks like uh, <coughs> my desk. Yeah, yeah my, my desk, desk right? <laughs> so, I guess we should probably introduce why we've been involved or interested in this. <clears throat> Glenn and I have had dreams of setting up a community Wi-Fi network for about 12 years. One of the problems with us doing this was, A, commercial gear is very expensive, um, especially back in the day, right? Yeah. Well, we've got some old 2.4 gigahertz card, which were the frequency hopping, so which are now probably illegal to use, <coughs> or cause a lot of interference, but... Yeah. So that was back in the days where it wasn't fully ratified. Um, I think they 11 meg if you were lucky. Not a, a good day. Yeah. And there was these pesky things called hills all over the place. Yeah. So on the beaches, it was pretty impossible. And we managed to do some bits and pieces. We got a link running between uh, Belrose and Forestville uh, a long time ago. But it just it's just too hard to do. There's too many hills. So we started doing some homework on potentially using meshes. And we'll explain the mesh concept a bit further. But the project kind of started by us starting to cobble together different bits and pieces. And in our research, we came across these guys. Um, what they were doing is they were trying to solve that Africa challenge. They were trying to figure out a way to link up multiple communities, multiple houses and deliver voice and data services. And it was very similar to what we were doing, so we got very interested in the project. So what these guys did is they got together and they did a few workshops, and this is a photo from one of them. And you'll see in here a lot of stuff that looks familiar. Stuff like the Linksys access points, they got an early... Um, What's the name of that? The ubiquity? The ubiquity, so the ubiquity yeah. um, Wi-Fi gear, which is commercial. They've got some other little bits and pieces, and we looked at that, and we thought, oh, yeah, that looks all familiar. We've been playing with some of this stuff. So what they did is they figured out that they needed to solve these challenges. Pretty straightforward for anyone that wants to start putting uh, a network together. And I think, aside from this, <coughs> which is obviously what I had to do, um, this is kind of like some of the stuff that we've been playing around with as amateurs as well, right? So especially if we're going to start putting surfaces out there and start playing around with some ruggedized stuff. We want it to be cheap, open, so we can play around with it. Uh, we want it to be tough. I don't know about quick and easy development. I don't know if that, or deployment, I don't know if that applies to the amateur well, media community. Yeah. Um, Not coders. So. Yeah. <laughs> and we wanted, or well, they wanted it to use uh, data and voice. Our interest was more around the data side of things. But again, it's data. Even the voice packets are data. So, they came up with this, which is a pretty good analogy of what the mesh potato is. So again, wireless access point, these things are a dime a dozen. You guys probably got a couple of these floating around your house. That's a ATA. You want to explain what an ATA is? So, uh, analog telephony adapter, so pretty much it takes a VoIP stream and converts it back to a, a um, PCM stream, analog stream, which you can plug a good old 1970s headset and into it, it still works. Uh, pretty much the same phone if you still got one at home. Same deal. And they wanted to spit it out as a ruggedized device. It's nice and easy, bit of sticky tape around the two, and it'll all be working. <laughs> so, the device they came up with, they went through a few, I'm saying, we're obviously abridging this, they, they went through a whole bunch of pre release models, they went through some different ideas, they, it was quite an exercise. I think this is probably the fourth revision that's actually version one that they yeah. deployed and shipped. And they needed this thing to be pretty tough. So what they did is they came up with a device that is pretty tough. It's, you can leave it outside, so it's UV protected uh, casing, it's waterproof, it's a sealed unit, uh, it'll take power in, so this is the bottom of it, so we can put DC, we can put power over the telephone socket, we can put power over Ethernet. Uh, it's got reverse polarity protection, so if we put naughty power into it, it won't blow up, and it'll take a pretty wide range of power sources. And you can stick 240 volts in and it won't fry. It'll just reset and keep resetting itself till you unplug the 240 volts. As they found out, it was a requirement when they were doing the prototyping that sometimes when you said, I need power to the device, they will just wire 240 volts to it. We get lost in translation. So. so these things had to be pretty tough, and they are. We can, we've done a few interesting things with them. So we won't bore you too much on the technical specs of these devices, but again, the spec is very similar to what you might have in a home access point or a home gateway. Uh, 8 mega RAM, uh, 8 mega flash, sorry, 16 mega RAM, 8 mega flash, um, BG for the moment on these units. 
Uh, what's nice is we can step the power inside the units and there's even a little button connector for an external antenna if we wanted it. Uh, that was a nice little addition that they threw on there. Um, yeah, so keep costs down, what that, add the connector at the time was going to add a few more dollars, redesign the case, so they just said, well, the idea is we just use the integrated antenna, which is just a bit of copper on the circuit board, really. Yeah. And um, it met the requirement, but in hindsight, I think they were a bit disappointed they didn't go for the external connector, as they found yeah. out. <coughs> but it is modifiable. There is an actual little pigtail jack there, and um, you can get an external antenna through it, but the next version will have an external connector on there. Um, so it's running the Asterix version on there, so that does the voice telephony part. So it's all SIP based. Um, it's got a pretty interesting way it does the dial plan, where out of the box you can configure these up through the handset. The last octet of the IP address is your extension number, and there's some um, routing within there that takes that last extension number, converts it to the IP address, so that way there's zero config on that. So basically this means you can drop it on the floor, plug it into a power source, configure it from the phone, and we'll show you how that works. And basically, start calling people. Nice and easy. You don't need a computer, you don't need computer knowledge, it just says enter the IP address and you punch it in. Yep. So really nice and straightforward. So pretty much any tech could do that, or in a disaster situation, they could be easily deployed to give you some sort of field comms in a sense. Very easy to configure, even pre-configured up, and just whack them out, give them power, and away you go. So malware like this, OpenWRT, you've been hacking around a fair bit with that. So nice open standard Linux. Um, Batman, Batman is the mesh routing protocol, so we'll touch on that a little bit more. Uh, Asterix, as Glenn said, open telephony. And the rest of it's pretty straightforward. Antenna, Ethernet port, and then the telephone port. So really straightforward hardware. Um, they did something really clever with the hardware. They basically found a company that was willing to manufacture it for them, but they did a deal with a company where they would also be able to sell them. So that's why these units here, it says Atcom, that's the mob that manufactures them on their behalf. And when you order them, you can basically get the unit from them. But the whole thing's pretty much open. So if someone wanted to muck around with it, they could, which is pretty nifty. How much do we pay for these? They're not expensive. Yeah, they're not, they're not too expensive. Um, the idea is if we buy them, that we're helping fund the project. So it's pretty generous. And they were pretty kind. They actually gave us three units to play with uh, and help with their testing. So we were pretty happy with that. We got free toys. So it's always fun. Alright, so we went through this, they're tough, you can power them through every single way, they use bugger all power, I think we've covered pretty much everything on that. It's got an AC and pattern. Excellent. Yeah, that's a uh, very high tech. Uh, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> Alright, serious business. There's two software revisions for this device, depending on what your use case was. So the basic firmware is designed really for uh, telephony and telephony only and that's what ships on the device and it is very very straightforward S simple IVR yeah. not too many bells and whistles um, the, the, they released the second software version which is the one we've put on here the idea of this one is you could potentially deploy it around a campus so what this allows is you to set up these devices across the site and the network ports on the devices can be connected to a computer so this is a nice little handy feature to have. Think of it almost like a big Ethernet switch with no wires in the middle. So again, it comes to the DR point of view, so that way you can have a laptop, a phone, just whack it in away you go. Yeah. So this can set up I've got here. The computer's connected up to this, to the Ethernet port. I can connect all the meshes that were stuck around the, the hall. Uh, but the phone also works. So you could potentially connect anything up to that, and the data's got to be sent across. <coughs> the other thing we'll touch on it is the data is sent across as layer two, which is a fancy way of saying that it doesn't need an IP address and we don't care what protocol it is. So you could be running different networks across it, you could be running different protocols, IP, IPX, Apple Talk, Day and Vines, um, I don't know. Retro. <laughs> <laughs> Retro stuff, okay. All right, so as I said, <coughs> WRT was the Linux distribution. Um, it's pretty common. It's available on all the different Wi-Fi um, routers these days. Uh, Mel set it up at the shack, it's running the APRS iGate, it's pretty robust. Um, one of the nice things about this is it's really well supported, so if it is something you guys wanted to play with, I bet you'd go on there, they've got a list of devices and you'd have something in your shack that would be able to run OpenWRT. So it's a, it's a nice uh, Linux distribution. We've also been doing a lot with the TP-Link sort of gear as yeah. well, it's another yeah. sort of platform that, to do the routing mesh functionality, obviously doesn't have the telephony, <coughs> so it's another revenue that they're looking at. Hmm. Here's where the fun starts. So, Batman 
<coughs> which they're really clever with their <laughs> initialisms. Um, it's basically a, a routing protocol that allows all the meshes to self-discover. So as we add these units to the network, they all look at where they're receiving data from and use that source information to then build a picture of what the network looks like. Okay. So I might have one at my next door neighbor's house, I have one and my neighbor down the road has one. And what it'll do, it looks at the whole network and if a single node drops out, it says, that's okay, he's gone, but I can still find my way to that, that node. So the whole system's survivable. The nice part is, once you configure the devices as a Batman node, there's actually no configuration. So if we were to go off and order another five of these units, we just turn them on and they connect up. And they start sniffing what's on that network and they start building their own links. So it's a really, really clever uh, system because once it's up, there's really no extra configuration. What's the basics of getting on the same network and not on someone else's network? As in channel? I don't know. Um, well, these use a different sort of mode. So they use an ad hoc demo. So normally you can't see them when you scan for Wi Fi. It's a different sort of driver level it's doing. Um, it still uses an SSID of some sort, but um, the way the ad hoc demo works is it's not displayable by a normal connect connecting client. So with the other software, the sequence software, we can actually turn these into access points as well on top of that. So pretty much it's like there is a unique ID that they've done by default, which you can change. And then obviously you've got your three non-overlapping Wi-Fi channels. If you bought five, and Carlo bought five, and you just wanted your five on your own network, yep. how would you get them not talking to each other? Um, you just change that unique number. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You put, what, put them all the same unique number. Uh, so if he, Glenn had his network and I had mine, he'd put his on his own number and I'd put oh, mine on mine. Okay. Yeah. The distant um, routers that opposite ends of the network that can't hear each other, can they still configure by... Yeah, all yeah. they'll do is they'll sit so there they'll, listening. They'll get it from the intermediate. <coughs> yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, and they'll find each other. And that happens pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, the nice part about it is you can also set a gateway. So you can advertise a distant router as that's your point out to the internet or that's your point out to another network. And then that will advertise throughout the whole mesh. Mm. So you have one little mesh node go down, everyone will wrap around it. Transit to get to yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's really clever. It's, it's, it's smart enough to say, all right, I know where everyone in the room is, but I'll whisper to one person and they'll whisper along. And it knows that because it listens to all the other whispering that's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So some of the deployment with models they've used a Ubiquity um, access point, which is commercial one, pretty good decent, you know, they'll put that up high somewhere and call it a super node, so pretty much everyone can hear that in a sense, so, or use the best path, then obviously can route around that yeah. as well. So those super nodes are like our repeater, it's like our two meter repeater. So, so you could use it with Kudi brand yes. and put this in with yeah. it. Okay. And that's pretty common, someone might put one of those really high up in the centre of a village, and they will use that as their primary node and everyone can see that. Um, the other thing you can do with these devices is not only can you provide gateway, and maybe an internet connection. You could also use that super node as a way out of the of the phone system to get out to the public <coughs> phone system. So if someone dials an extension, they're within that private network. But if they want to dial out international, that super node could provide that, and they might sell a access card or a subscription or have a billing service on that. Yeah. So as part of the vanilla software that comes with it, there is an added um, village telco server that will actually do little prepaid cards, scratch cards, sort of things. So they could actually start up a little business selling minutes from a SIP trunk provider or something similar to that. Yeah. What's the scalability of this slide? Um, in the base configuration, you can fill up a C class, so 256 nodes. But it'll, yeah. go, it'll go beyond that. Okay, yeah. But obviously, <coughs> since you're meshing them, every time you go through the mesh, you're going to lose half your bandwidth. So there are probably about four or five hops. But what you can do is, as they've got Ethernet ports, you can bridge that out to a, a hard one to elsewhere. So you can create little networks out of these. It's still part of the mesh, and then it knows that, okay, that one is four hops away, but if I go for this one who has an Ethernet connection over there, it's only two hops, I'll go yeah. that way. So you can scale it that way. So you can sort of have hub and spoke networks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a lot of sites will do is they'll have these things between <coughs> houses, and then as the cable comes into the house, they'll have another wireless network for inside the house. And again, that'll cut down <coughs> on the usage. Uh, in the future, as we'll talk about it, it is something that they are looking at, and that's why they'll, they're looking potentially to split the backhaul up. So you'll have a Wi-Fi network on one band and the backhaul on another. Okay. Um, in our testing, I mean, this isn't high speed, right? This isn't NBN. 
Um, it, it's, it's not something you're going to be doing full high def video through. It's here now. Yeah. Well, this is true. <laughs> um, but in our testing, it's decent. It's enough for, for passing good quality voice and for basic data. And that's without us tweaking anything. So yeah. there are tweaking. Um, obviously, is it set up to do the lowest broadcast or broadcast out a meg, which means you're going to get pretty far coverage. But when you actually try and use it for something, it's going to drop back and you're going to lose sync to it. So um, there's different ways to change the broadcasting, um, different ways to do the packing doubles and all other tricks to make it work, work even better. Um, so these are the nice parts. This is what I really love about it. The devices don't even have to have an IP address. They are just connecting in like it's an Ethernet port on a switch, so we don't care what OS, what protocols, all that stuff will work. Uh, the clients can roam between nodes, which is nice again, so you could potentially open this up and as someone wanders down the street with a smartphone, they'll bounce between them, because you can enable an access point mode. Um, so how long does it take the network to reconverge when you... <laughs> it's, we haven't been able to measure it properly, because it's always sort of up by the time we it's get to quick. testing it, so it's quick. Um, we did some tests uh, just around my place where we had one right in the backyard and one up the street and one in the back of Glenn's car and, and we were fine, we'd reboot nodes and you go reboot and by the time you sort of figured out your test it was well and truly healed. Because the way the mesh protocol works it actually does load balance as well so it will, whatever it can it will try and load balance and it will detect when a node goes offline pretty quick as well. So. Yeah. And it's smart enough to know that if the signal strength between you know, say Glenn and I, if it's really quite low, but you've got better signal strength to Glenn and I've got great to you, it'll actually route it around. So it, it knows the quality of the links as part of its routing calculations. Um, and that's part of this whole self-building, healing and scaling. So layer two, does it use MAC address? MAC addressing? Yeah, basically MAC address routing. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's some weighting on it. It seems to run like a spanning tree equivalent with a few other um, unique things. So if you fire up Wireshark, you do some see some... SPF yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that, yeah. yeah. It's nifty. Um, there's some really high-end technical white papers that we've been trying to digest, and they're... Um, it's a very good university details. subject. So yeah. People do thesis and PhDs on this. Yeah. We've sent our results from testing these to a couple of guys doing their PhDs, and we sort of replied, yeah, <coughs> love to read your uh, thesis when you finish it, because <laughs> there's just some parts to this that just... It's really clever. It's really, really clever. Um, so that's the Batman component. And then there's Asterix. So Asterix is an open source PABX. Um, it's, it's very similar to, oh geez, all the commercial ones like your Cisco style um, telephony products. The whole cool thing is it's completely open source. So it's free, you can download it, you can run a PABX at home. It's good. Yeah, it's nifty. And like I was saying before, the dial plan they invented for this deployment is really good that there's no configuration to map IPs to extension numbers. So you can have the same extension number of all different networks and you know it will just work. So the way they do it is they picked a dummy extension of four thousand at the IP address. Mm -hmm. So when you actually when these uh, mesh potatoes are dialing to each other, when you dial the extension, it goes, okay, you're trying to call twenty two, it gets the IP address, puts twenty two on the end and puts four thousand on the front and calls that number. So it's always four thousand. Does anyone get what a dial plan is? Let's explain it. So, pretty much, uh, it's like your radio frequency allocation in a sense. So, obviously, your home phone or your mobile phone, you've all got a number. It is in some sort of format, E164 in a sense. So, 6 ones Australia, 4 for mobile, 2 for Sydney, etc. Um, usually, with a closed system with a PABX, for convenience, it's usually the last three or four digits. Or if you're a bigger enterprise, it ends up being 6 or 7, which sort of negates the purpose of having extensions. Um, so part of that is to allow a closed group of users to quickly dial each other and then also to extend on that you can at least cost route between buildings, offices, countries, etc. So um, I do IV telephony for a job and managing dial plans for large financial institutions is very challenging at times, more so when you bridge the international borders because then you have cultural reasons for some certain numbers they don't like for various reasons because <laughs> yeah. they might mean death or That's other things. No fours. Yes. Or yes. Or yes. yes. Well, if you get on a plane in Hong Kong, you find out there's no road four or 13. So <laughs> they take both avenues there. Um, and in Australia, if you get an extension starting 1-3, you know you're not liked because you, everyone misdials it and thinks they're calling a 1-300 number and you 
get upset. So you know you've upset someone when you get an extender starting one three zero. They really don't like it. <laughs> so just to let you know that. What happens when your banana rots away? No more telephony. Well, it's open source and organic, so it should be yeah, right yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, So yeah. that's pretty much it. So Asterix is, as Carl was saying, an open source POVX solution. So there's a few different flavors where you can get it on a DVD, <coughs> spin it up, and it will work out of the box. There's also companies that sell hardware, so you can basically buy it supported from an organization, mm -hmm. throw it into your company, and if it all goes bad, you can call someone. So Asterix is a really good project for this because it's absolutely taking off, completely standards based, and there is people out there that can support it. Yeah. Obviously not on this platform, but there is companies out there that will support it. So you, have, the, you have one instance of Asterix per... Right right yes, it's running on each node. Yeah. It seems sort of like massively overpowered for what you actually wanted to do. It works. And kind of complicated, but it well, works, I guess. Well, it's, in a sense, it's just loading a single dial plane to itself. So. Yeah. It's just a way of them scripting it, and you need some sort of SIP engine because it's all running SIP for the yeah. telephony part. So, running, it still needs to talk to something. So, at least doing it this way, it just has to talk to itself and it broadcasts to something else. So, it is autonomous in a sense, but yes, there are pretty much every node is a POBX in a sense. So, how do the nodes discover it? Um, so, it comes back to the way the dial plan's done. It's all done based on the last three digits you dial, okay. which is based on the last octet of the IP address, that then shoots it off to that node. So every station is actually extension 4000 in a sense virtually. The, the real key with this was for them to be standalone. Yeah. Okay. If they had a master instance of Asterix and it yeah. fell over, you lose the whole network. Of yeah. And then how's the IP, uh, uh, the IP address plan? How's that? So you can set it to whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So in our demo <laughs> network, it's 10.130.1, so it's a 10 range. Mm -hmm. um, you can change that to be whatever you want. And the node addresses automatically? Configure you can configure to do that if you want as well, but typically you don't because you need them to have a static phone number. So when you, when you get a vanilla one, you basically pick up the phone and you can dial an extension and it says, what's my IP address? So you just type 10, so it was so 0 and 0, you put the IP address in, give it a subnet mask, and that's it. So I was just thinking, you know, when you're deploying a whole case of these to some you know, village in Africa, you know, yeah. it's, not, it's not just plug and play, it's plug and play. It's a plug, and then on the phone. Well, usually the, the way they deploy it, they don't train the trainer sort of thing. So they have a couple of guys that know these are the codes you punch in to do this. Yeah. But there are tools to automate the configuration where you can you know, plug a whole bunch of them in and get them to configure up and stably set some config on there. But again, the, the target market for us is pretty much you know it's very simple. So you know it's a couple of key buttons and it works. And it's pretty much just to get some basic comms in a village area in a sense. So it may not ever talk to the internet or to the PSDN, and, but at least that way they can at least call down the road. Because I think one of the examples they gave was in Nauru, where apparently uh, GSM reception was a little bit flaky there or very expensive, and they had a system where you could find anyone on the island by nodding and wink winking. They seem to, when people drive the cab, they nod and wink and they go, oh yeah, we saw James on road two about half an hour ago. And you know, that's the way you go. And so you go to the next person, but you go up there and say, have you seen James? Oh yes, from 10 minutes ago and over there. Okay, so you know, you sort of do, and that was just the way they did it. But um, there was another open system called Open BTS, which is an open GSM um, module which runs with Asterix. And then you can actually have a GSM base station, assuming the local telco government, which in the room is the same thing, allow you to do that. And you could, they started issuing their own little telephony network just for on net dialing within the... But that gets highly political. It gets highly political because obviously, yeah, but I mean... One of, the, one of the deployments of that open GSM system is that there's politics between the people that provide the island's internet and they've got a Wi-Fi network and they say that the GSM interferes with the Wi-Fi and yeah, the, you read their blog and you just feel yeah. like crying for them, it's real pain. So, yeah, so the whole key with this thing is just independence, you can throw them out. And what it's caused is that in a lot of the countries where these things have been deployed, it's created these little entrepreneurs that will go off and sell these nodes. So they'll come in, configure it, put it up on the roof for you, and then you've got the service. And they'll manage it as a little telco, mm -hmm. which is nice. So there's some company that sponsors the Asterix development, and they sell... Digium, I think. Digium. Yeah. They sell the hardware, so... They, 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 so if you wanted to put in a, a gateway, you'd have a PC with one of these Digium boards. Yep. If you want to, you can buy like an E1 interface so you get 30 phone lines. Or if you go for a SIP trunk, then you don't need the boards anymore. I'm guessing these guys probably don't have that sort of cash, so... <laughs> well, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the idea with this though is you, you can interface it with one of those systems. And because it's Asterix, you can get a little bit more involved under the covers and start building it out to, to authenticate back. As long as you've got internet connectivity, you can talk to any of these. You can sip trunk it yeah. and off you go. Yeah. yeah. And this is all just out of the box. The cool thing about this is if you don't like the Asterix implementation, it's not locked down, it's not changed. You just crack open the file and you can modify it. So if you wanted to have these things as just dummy notes, yeah. Let's just do a Skype module as well, don't they? Yeah, I haven't played with it. There's a Skype out, I think. Yeah. So you, can, you can hook it into Skype. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that was invite only or something, and maybe it's... Dodgy, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the word of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a technical term, is it? <laughs> yeah. All right, so this is what the installation looks like. Um, obviously, it's a pretty exciting event, but need to keep it simple. Nice... I don't know, would you say that's a stick? Mars. Stick. Yeah. <laughs> Mars. It's a flagpole, right? Yep. It's not a tower, yep. it's not anything. So really straightforward, we can run a single wire up into the, <coughs> into the mesh. That can be the ethernet or just the, the, the phone plug. And with that, they give us a little adapter um, that we can, it's basically POT or uh, POE. I actually have one in here somewhere. So it comes with uh, one of these little doobie whackers. So in that, I can plug in DC voltage and it's going to spit uh, power over telephone. Uh, or we can do POE or we can just run the cable uh, straight up to it. Um, standard phone, so again, it doesn't have to be anything too modern. We tested that, that worked, so all right. Uh, and we can also enable this thing to also do Wi-Fi. So if they've got a brand new shiny tablet, phone, PC, then they can connect up into the mesh. And that's again how we can start offering uh, intranet or internet services through this. Which is kind of new. Could you run a SIP client on your tablet yep. in Wi Fi? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. yep. We'll, go, we'll show you that. So, as part of that Zircon firmware, you can select the node to be a master node and then you can register soft phones to that node and have some ability of the soft phone client. So, yes. when, it's, when, when you know it's acting as both an access point and a <coughs> mesh node, um, how's it? Swapping modes is it doing it on different. It's frequencies? just virtual. No, it's just virtual. Yeah. So it's just like broadcasting in the sense two MAC addresses. So. And that does cut down your bandwidth. So that's again something on the to-do list. <coughs> yeah. um, in our testing, we tested both, but we did most of our testing where we didn't do that, yeah. and we were running these just in Ethernet mode and connecting our test equipment to the end of that Ethernet port, um, just so we get some pure data on what the mesh is doing. Uh, we did do one test at Longroof with Jeff where he did have his laptop connected to the access point whilst it was also meshing and yeah we lost probably about a third and a bit more of bandwidth but yeah. it still was reasonable for what it was doing. That's why a lot of these implementations they won't mess with that they'll just put another access point. And you, you said that it's not your frequency right? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. It's just sand mode 2.4. <coughs> so someone knows a DHCP server on the network you could... Yep. He jumped yep. in 10 seconds to it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Fire wall there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, again, remember, not enterprise grade kit. Um, small enterprise grade. Maybe very small enterprise kit. Uh, so, this is what some of the uh, deployments of this can look like. So, numbers in blue is IP address of the mesh potato. And obviously, phone number 11 is because the IP address ends in 11, so that's our dial plan. So we know this guy's full phone number is 192.168.1.11. Notice his computer, he can be on the same network, or that could be totally different. That could be something else. That could be 10 dot, that could be anything we wanted to, which is pretty nifty. Um, again, down the bottom here, we've got a switch, so we're just bridging the mesh potato into a switch, and we're going to have a whole bunch of computers sitting down here as well. So this is pretty much showing that ADSL route of internet, that's the DHCP server, so your link sys or whatever you're providing you, so whatever DHCP that's serving out, that's going and broadcasting across the mesh there. Yeah. That's kind of the same thing, you just treat it as just one big ethernet switch. So your dot is acting as your gateway. Yeah. Yep. No, whatever the... Yeah, whatever, whatever the DSL is, so that's how it's dot that one, that's your gateway. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is nifty, and you could potentially mark some of these ports as gateway ports as well, so it knows from a layer 2 perspective. If I don't know where it is, send it this way. But in a basic deployment, you wouldn't have to do that, which is nifty. Alright, so this is where we started doing some performance testing. We wanted to see how far we could actually push these units. Um, we ran them from batteries, which was um, pretty cool, because they don't use much power. 
and uh, we wanted to see how far and how much throughput we could actually get through these devices. So we uh, went off and set up. So that's Glenn up on DY Headland. We strapped one to the top of the uh, of a squid pole on the top of the no parking sign, and we had a battery at the bottom. Glenn on the phone, and we got awesome, strange looks from everyone. Yes, <laughs> more than usual. <laughs> Probably the best comment was we had two people walk past. One person saying, "Oh, I know what he's doing." Then he sees me pick up the phone. He goes, "I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I knew, but it seems to be, uh, we're just going to keep walking." So, yeah, I found one of these on a pole at DY. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, so we had Jeff. Jeff was up here on Long Reef. Uh, that's Jeff's setup. Uh, I was down in Collaroy squid pole with this thing on the top. Uh, and Glenn was uh, up in DY with another mate of ours, Dave. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a Google uh, map of what we had. So we figured out 2.18 kilometres line of sight between Jeff and Glenn and Dave down there in DY headland, and I was 2.51 kilometres uh, away. So yeah. Easier to What's that, sorry? Capazio Turner. <laughs> <laughs> they, they know me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is basically some of the data. Now, on that day, we found I was by myself. The mesh just couldn't stretch that far, which is a bit of a shame. Um, interestingly enough, I had, we had our handhelds as well, as well, and on two metres, I couldn't even talk to Glenn. So Jeff became the repeater. Um, but Glenn and uh, Jeff had no dramas. And this is how the Batman system will actually show you what your routing table or connections look like. So it's all done in MAC addresses. If you really want to be crafty, you can go in there, fill out a file, and basically it's like DNS for MAC addresses. It'll fill out who's doing what. And there was no gateways on the network, so that was uh, blank. But we did all right, didn't we? Yeah, so um, it was pretty a bit of latency. And the reason was apparent from the first slide was the signal was sort of coming and going because a seagull decided to nest on top of the mashed potato. Oh, okay. <laughs> it did affect it a lot, <laughs> to a point where it completely went dead and we said, look it up, and there he is. There he is. So the the way, so so the the metal band speed. on its leg, which is a short <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we found the resonant frequency of a uh, <laughs> seagull, so <laughs> that's another paper. It's only around 100 milliwatt, isn't it? It's tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what it was, what we had it set to? I can't remember what we had it set to. Depending on, you can actually change it. I can't remember if we but yeah, it's pretty. It. It's pretty. Yeah, low. It's low. Internal antennas, that's pretty. Low. It's not bad. Yeah, yeah it's not yeah. bad. Um, so we peaked at about a meg, which was pretty nifty. But the average was kind of this graph between 250 and 500k a second. I remember Jeff was also in the access point mode, so if we hmm. connected straight to Ethernet, we may have doubled that up. We got a bit more. Um, and you know, yeah, the the jitter is not <coughs> ideal. Up to uh, I don't know. The average is less than 25. To be honest, less than 25 over yeah. Wi-Fi over 2.5Ks with an inside nice. antenna and a seagull on the antenna. You probably fail some SLAs, but I mean, uh... It's not enterprise, yeah. not bad. Um, what some people have done is I've seen people put uh, grid arrays up and strap one of these things to the front of the grid array. Um, there's, I'll show you later, there's a little cardboard or a little cutout template that you can make for people to stick <coughs> in the back of them. Uh, and if you really want to be crafty, you can open it up and connect an antenna to the inside. Yeah. Pretty nifty. So, but it worked. We had comms. These guys are talking to each other uh, over the phone, yeah. and, and the sound quality was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, was which good. one, boys? So, CPU. Yeah. 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 So it does MU and ALOR and also GSM. So the CPU on that can't run ILBC. So GSM, it's not too bad, but it does start to drive the CPU on that. What's interesting about the FXS module on that? It's actually serial. So it's tapping onto a 115k serial port. So it's, they've done some real trickery to get the cost really down by using a serial port rather than using something else, system on a chip and all that. So it's quite interesting how they do it all. And from that... My ear's not good enough to figure out the difference between some of these codecs. This guy can figure out a PAVX based on how the call sounds. Um, and your testing... Ah. You don't really need the GSM, but... No, like, um, because the, the other thing is, since it's going over the Wi-Fi, to send shorter packets, you're using more air time, in a sense, like, you're wasting more time in all the preambles, all the headers, and all that. So you're actually better off trying to send a larger frame. So some guys have even started sending, you know, 100 milliseconds of voice at a time, when normally you send about 20, because they actually find that 100 milliseconds works quite well on the mesh, and people... As long as it's constant, you'll get used to it, and as long as you're not talking to them in the same room, you probably won't notice. So, the ITU recommends about... Sorry? What does the delay end up being? 
that's one way. Yeah. So ITU recommend you shouldn't notice anything under 150 milliseconds. Not normally. Not normally. Once you're getting to 250, you're going, oh, something's a bit strange. Above 500, say, so you talk on a satellite because this is getting expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and above 500, you're talking to one of the robots at Mars, you know, like one of the spirit of opportunities or something like that coming back to you. Um, yeah. Yeah, so for us, we only deploy with three units that day. We've got plans that we're going to put all five out there. Um, we're looking for a, a place that's a bit better real-world scenario of the test where there's a bit more Wi-Fi interference. So we're thinking of deploying the original three and then maybe one up a Colorado and one down near Narrabeen Lake somewhere. In my house. <laughs> hey, we need two more operators. <laughs> um, external antennas is something we want to play around with. We haven't had a chance to play, but we've got all the gear. Um, and uh, we want to try and find a better way of measuring the results because you know, we were using a few different network test um, applications, one called IPPerf. Uh, it's good, does a trick, but we need to be a little bit more stringent with our testing. Uh, that way we know we're measuring the same results every time or the same data every time properly. Uh, so that's on the to-do list. If anyone wants to join in, let us know. Um, this is a little bit of the hacking that these guys have come up with. So this is just a cardboard cutout you download off the internet, you build it out of metal, strap it onto the back of the unit, and this is supposed to increase the, uh, the capabilities. Right, four to five k's line of sight using that. Mm. Yeah, so, so this popped out after we were doing our testing uh, and everyone got pretty excited, so. <coughs> so we might get our metal work skills out in the tin snips and give it a go. Mm. I see a hospital visit, but we'll yeah. give it a go. <laughs> <That's> yeah. All. <laughs> all right, futures. So, at the moment it's a bit of a one shoe, or one size fits all. So they're gonna split it up into three. Um, yeah, 2.4 for access, 5 gig for backhauls on the on the table. I haven't seen too much information. This is all really new. Uh, this has just come out on how they're actually going to implement that. Uh, and I like the, this idea where they're going to split it up into multiple models because this gives us a little bit more flexibility about what we deploy where. We might have a simpler unit in one place and then a, a more uh, specy unit to run a, a gateway or to be a primary on the on the asterisk. Because what's actually interesting now the cost of just the basic IP phones are getting that so low. Mm. By the time you have the FXS port and an analog handset, it might be cheaper just to get the cheapest IP phone mm. and remove that leak completely. Mm. So then this is just going to become an autonomous node when you may not even need asterisks on there at the end. Um, I liked this one, Catwoman. Uh, I had to try and find a photo of Catwoman that wouldn't uh, be too risque and distract everyone. Um, but this is basically what Ben was talking about by increasing the packet sizes, which is kind of nifty. Um, so yeah, we're waiting to see a bit more on this. They're playing around with a lot of commercial hardware for this one. Um, but when I say commercial, we're not talking the big names, we're talking about a lot of the consumer commercial stuff. TP Link. TP Link is an example, yeah. Because um, again, if they can keep the cost of the hardware as low as possible, then that means more of these units can see the real world. Um, especially now that some of these little TP Link devices have got, you know, Ethernet ports and USB ports built in, it means you might actually be able to strap two of them together, a 5 gig model or 2.4, Connect them together and you're in business. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so cheap. Um, I mean, the price, like, this is probably about two years old now, this unit. So, I mean, the price, you know, two years is amazing what you can get for 20, 30 bucks. So, yeah. So, TP Link makes some dual band stuff as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's amazing what the yeah. um, Athros chips, I think it is. And mm -hmm. it's just, just single chips does everything else. Quite amazing. What's cool about this project is the development uh, team is global. So there's a couple of peeps in Australia, there's people in South Africa, there's a couple of peeps in the US, people spread across Asia. So they're all just basically going out buying consumer hardware, throwing on the, the right OS, uh, Linux and all the rest of it and off they go. Plus Batman, you can run it on a desktop or a laptop. Um, we didn't have much luck with it running in an emulated OS with VMware, but it will run natively on the system. And you can make a laptop a node that participates within the mesh as well. So again, it's really easy to start mucking around with some of these bits and pieces, which is cool. Uh, these are the deployments they've got so far. Um, they're all in varying different sizes and with different motivations. Uh, some of the earliest ones have grown pretty well, well over 100 nodes, which is really nice to see. Uh, and some of them. Right, demo, you guys want to see it? Yep. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yep. Alright. We need some volunteers. Alright, so, first things first. Bruce, <laughs> 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 
So they give you this software. This software allows you to actually manage and look at the network. So this just runs on a Linux PC. Uh, here's a Linux PC. So just get it to update. There's a Linux PC, and what this does is this will look at all the clients that are out there on the mesh, and we can name them. We've just put dummy data in, so the latitude and longitudes we've used are totally made up. That's going to ask that. Yes, building. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but we did that so we could just play around with the map, and obviously this is not real GPS data <laughs> or real link size. But oh, record for two. It is. <laughs> By the way. None of you will have children ever again. But, um, now, in here it's pretty cool because what we can do is we can actually hover over uh, different sites and get some data out of it. Uh, we can get some more little technical details over what the mesh can see and what they can, uh, who they can connect to, which is kind of nifty. Um, the other cool thing about the map, change that. The one of the cool things about the map is it'll also change colour depending on the signal strength and uh, the quality of the links. So in a community where you've got a lot of different links set up, we can instantly see, okay, one of them's good, one of them's bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one's got a seagull. And one of them's got a seagull on it. <laughs> so this software is pretty straightforward to set up. It just pulls one of the devices and grabs its data from there, um, which is pretty easy. Uh, this is also a nice little interface. You can add new clients in. Um, we can start playing around with what we want to see as far as the metrics from both the Batman routing protocol and from the, uh, the Wi-Fi. Uh, and that's the installation. So yeah, nice and easy to do. So each node in the network has a complete view of the entire network topology? It'll build one. Yes. Yeah, it'll build one out. Um, I think I, I reckon your limitation on that's basically RAM, to be honest. Um, we haven't been out of it, just the units we've got push that, but that's my, my goal. A later version of the Batman do to some dis distribution of the MAC addresses as well, so mm -hmm. rather than trying to broadcast to everything, does a hash table so that when it tries to find something, it knows where to sort of go hunt around. So it really is pretty efficient in that sense. So, so if, you're, if you're acting as an access point, you're giving internet access, you want to do things like what, landing pages, manage yes. bandwidth, all that stuff. And does this do that, or is that sort of like version 3? No, this doesn't do it directly. Yeah. Um, you're already about the guy. Yeah, so there are some <coughs> other servers. So what some other people have done is um, they've set up they give people a little router and it runs a PPTP client on it. So pretty much they're setting up a VPN back into a head service and that way they tunnel all the internet through there. They can do the quas, they can do data limits, landing pages and all that sort of stuff. So that's where it's sort of getting towards more the small business sort of in a sense, where they're trying to then start centralising. Yeah. You do it it gives some sort of you know, basic quas, even if you're just doing it for a village or whatever, you know, yeah. somebody yeah. wants to download some ISO file or something, yeah. then you, know, you don't want them Yeah, it, them yeah. you don't want them to else. destroy the telephony side of it yeah. as well. And that can happen. So, I mean, it does run Linux, obviously, so the IP table, so we can set up some so sort of... Do, basically. Yeah. Okay. As a cool thing, everything on this is customizable, so they haven't hard-coded anything. Um, so, when you connect to one of the devices, this is the screen you see. And this is again just showing me all the meshes that we can connect to. So we've got five of them set up in this room and it's just saying I can see all my neighbours. Um, if you wanted to get into a little bit more detail, you can connect into, uh, into one of the interfaces. There we go. And we can change things like IP addresses. It'll find its own gateways. We can give it a name. Uh, we've done this. This is the, the Wi-Fi component of it. This is why we can see them all coming up as separate Wi-Fi access points. Usually you'd have that as the same, so you can roam between them all. Yep. If you want to do the access point mode, so you click on advanced there, you should see. Uh, yep. Uh, what are we looking for? Where it goes SSID for mesh wireless. This is where Dom was saying. So by default, it comes up as VT mesh. So that sort of is your network identifier. So if you wanted to have VT mesh one, then that's a totally separate system to this. They can coexist on the same channel, there'll be a bit of interference, but that's life. Mm -hmm. And from here, this is where we can lock the radios down. So if we lock it down to 8 or 11 g you get a bit better performance because it sort of cuts out the lower speeds in a sense. And from here, we can also increase the power and also set up the um, SIP trunks from here. So you could set a node as your master. There's an option here to set it as a master node, which then will set up from memory 5 or 10 soft phone accounts. And then you can connect with your mobile Wi-Fi device.
and by default, it's in the code it's due, um, GSM, it reduce the bandwidth, but we found using new, new or A laws pretty sufficient. Um, this is cool too, because you can set one of them up as a dish, if so you wanted to. So the future of these things will almost be where you could have a house with a couple of soft phones in them, all those connect up into the mesh, the mesh runs an asterisk instance, and then that connects off to the rest of the world. So you can almost have a, a little in-house PADX, which is kind of nifty. You're uh, probably fine now with like, um, VMware and all that sort of stuff. It's getting cheaper just for a single little server and like, a tiny thing mm. that can do a lot of its functionality now and centralise mm. a lot of this. Like so. the ITX. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I don't know if you'd be doing a Raspberry Pi of this. There probably is someone, but... Too expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't get them. Yeah. Um, we can crypto the whole thing. Um, we've got it set to off, but there is a way to turn on crypto, um, which again is kind of nice. But you wouldn't do that unless you really had to. There's an OCA. Yeah. Right. So well, it's also encrypting the mesh as well as the access point. So at yeah. the moment, it's That's all the clear access. text. Yeah. Right? It's all clear. It's, it's sort of hidden for obscurity because it's using ad hoc demo mode, so you won't see it unless you go you looking for it. Root your driver and sense and turn into that mode. So. But the access points have security modes, so that's for the AP. But yeah, this is for the mesh. Um, again, remember where these are going. So what encryption algorithm does it happen to use for the mesh? At the moment, none. If, if what's available, does it have anything? Or I, do we even, I don't even remember looking at that. <laughs> we just comes disabled, we left it. I'm pretty yeah. sure it's WPA, but I don't know if it's WPA. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but that's for, that's for yeah. the data, for the wireless access point. No, no, no. For the mesh, I believe there's a WPA mode on it. But I, don't I think there is a basic WPA yeah. for it. It, but otherwise, key. you can pretty much run WWPA2 mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, we, we haven't updated the firmware for a couple of months. The firmware rockets along, so this is still a release candidate. Because um, their philosophy, or the Batman philosophy, is it's a layer 2, we're not going to encrypt that. You want to encrypt anything, you do that on top of it. You do it in layer, layer yeah. 7. Yeah. So, for example, one, one method with the asterisk is you could use what's called ZRTP, which is the encrypted one. And that's all done in band within the codec itself, so that way the signal will still be clear, but all the encryption's done within the payload, so it, it's encrypted in a sense. So again, it comes down to these things don't have a lot of horsepower to start with. And if you need a fully encrypted wireless network, this isn't for you. Yeah. Could be a nice junket trip somewhere where these are manufactured, and just say, no, not suitable, go somewhere else, but yeah, probably won't. I had a question for you, just thinking on the system, the mesh, it's a, uh, somewhere along the line will connect into the, one of the national networks, right? Uh, well, not, not the target places these are going, because typically, mm -hmm. typically if you think about some of these African villages or yeah, villages yeah. in Asia, there is no national network. Yeah, right. So these things will typically stand alone. Maybe one of them will connect to the internet. Mm. They provide basic internet. What, what, I'm, what, um, what I'm trying to see is there'll be administrative costs if you do. Mm -hmm. How do you pass that back to the That's users? Not, that depends on the operator. So what some of the operators have done is they've charged a install fee, and the install fee will bankroll the, the running of these. Some others have monetized it by charging for calls and offering mm -hmm. calls and internet. Uh, some of them have monetized it by an ongoing monthly cost. Mm -hmm. But that all depends on how they wanted to deploy it. And, and under what rules they wanted to, to run the network. Um, a lot of NGOs are using these now as a way of replacing mobile phones, and they just, they're interested in using it as a PABX. So it just calls between a, a single place, and that's kind of what we're more interested in, in potentially deploying it, where it's just it's used within a campus. I doubt with this, again. <laughs> not enterprise. Uh, I don't know, you said rear share price, they might have to. <coughs> So what we can do is, I'm just going to go into, this is a SIP client, and we can do some cool stuff with this. So you can dial numbers. You wouldn't have to do this, obviously. You just dial 7774. Reading out the signal to noise ratio, a higher reading is better. 1, 20, 8. So she will tell you all sorts of wonderful things about your mesh. So pretty much you dial that from the node you're on. So you dial 774, which spells RSSI, mm -hmm. and it'll give you a signal strength through the prompts. 
of roughly what it can see. It won't tell you who or what it is. It's just saying, I can hear three nodes and the signal strength. So basic tech can go out and they go, okay, it's talking to the mesh somehow. So I'm here, I can leave. Yeah. yeah. The wireless IP address is... 10.10.1.20. Thank you. Very polite. <laughs> The Ethernet IP address is 10.1.130.1.20. You basically get all the data out of directly. So that's one of the advantages of Asterix. So that's just pulling some scripts and some config data from mm -hmm. itself and just reading it out as um, basic prompts. So we can ring them. So that's one in the Tell shower. Me the phone, Anyone? No? Somebody answer it? Oh, it's on, yeah. Someone answer it? It's a phone range. That's all there. American ringtones. That's a Telstra touch phone. Hello. Right. How are we? Somebody, no one's talking to you yet. Oh, Someone call, else has to answer. Hello. Who are you all about? So what's nice is to improve our customer service and for your security, this call may be recorded or 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 this call may be what else can we shut off? And like with these, I've just plugged into the Ethernet, so just to sort of illustrate, you know, I get a pretty good ping to all of them. We put one outside on the tower. Well, I thought the battery went out. So, you know, it's not bad considering that's outside and that's actually meshing through one of the other ones. So that's two hops to get out there. So it's not too bad at all, which is pretty good. And the one that we're pinging now, that's running off the 12 volt battery been out there for a couple of hours and the battery hasn't been charged in way long. So they're pretty cool. Um, some of the deployments they're using a uh, solar charging system. So they're just using a commercial one off the shelf, throw it up on the, on the roof, plug it in and off with you. A commercial with the $10 eBay special. Yeah, that's the commercial stuff. Mm -hmm. This stuff so is about cheap cheap. You're pinging from where to where? My laptop through the mesh. So from here to there so the one to the one that's near the door and then it goes outside. So the one that's hanging off the things. tower. Yeah. It's not very far. Not very far, but I didn't want to go for too long a walk. <laughs> 2.5 k's is a bit of a walk. But, you know, it's more about the hops rather than the distance, and mm. yeah, it's not too bad. Have you ever turned one on and it's connected to another network? <coughs> so you don't have any data about mm. how many might be in Australia? Um, in Australia, there's no implementations yet. Um, we don't have that, yeah, there's not many here yet. There is one that's in design phase that we we haven't played around with yet. Um, it's actually a guy that works for Telstra, so hopefully uh, <laughs> used to, yeah. used to. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's still in design phase. We have to try and chase up where that one's at. Actually, that sounds very interesting. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's uh, that's these toys. This is the mesh stuff. There was some fair bit of stuff done by a guy in Adelaide with yep. Timor. Yeah. Yep, yep. So he's one of the developers of the unit. Yeah, David Rowe, I think. Yeah. VK. DRQ. Yeah, it might be DR. So he. Uh, so he's the one who's been developing the Kodak 2. Yeah. Ah, right, yeah. So he also sells some <coughs> uh, little PABX equipment as well. And I think it's used for the same manufacturer as well. It's probably where they got the connection from. Yeah, yeah this is him from yeah. memory. That's him. Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's one of the main developers of this thing, which is pretty cool. We've got one up on him. He didn't have a seagull on his peers. So, you know, yeah, he's doing wonderful. It works. Yeah. Um, and on here, this is one of the, de the, de the deployments. I think he did this one was involved with I this think one, it was a team from, yeah. from memory. Um, I reckon we need to get this guy involved in our repeater. 
Yeah, he's yeah. still over it. Safety third. Um, but this is this is an <laughs> illustration of some of the meshes that these guys have set up. So they're I'm pretty sure that's done with the ubiquity as the supernova there. Yeah. So obviously a lot of nodes can hear it but can't talk back to it, so that's where it has to hop on the way back. Um, just sort of talking about commercialization of these things. Um, some of these guys have set them up. Um, so you can sort of see they're being deployed all over the place, they're being strapped to all sorts of houses. Which cuts all the We're filming this, we'll come up to you. Um, so no, oh, definitely not. As I said in the beginning, Glenn and I just wanted to set up a community play. network. This is before people had ADSL. We just wanted to play games. Um, everyone was on dial-up and we thought how cool would it be if we could all connect our houses. So over the last 10 years we've played around with little bits and pieces. Now, I certainly don't want to commercialise this. I just think that this is such a cool technology and it's such a well-packaged product. It's a waste if it doesn't go out there when it might help someone for 60 to 100 bucks a node. It's, it's that simple. Um, so these guys have been running around putting them on all sorts of things. Um, this one I thought was probably the funniest deployment. That looks pretty <laughs> legit. Um, but they've been running around throwing them out, uh, out there. Um, yeah, it's certainly don't have the same legislation. Um, yeah, this is pretty. So this guy's got 83 running in a network, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But certainly, I just I'd love to see it if there's a, a community out there that's suffering without comms, and we could deploy a couple of these. We're in business. I mean, it'd probably be doing for some special events. Like I know we go do some of the bike events and all that. Maybe something like this could be helpful to be deployed, that's just to allow people to have a basic phone to make a basic call. That way, if um, a ham operator is not available, they're busy. They can at least get somewhere as well. I'm just, just wondering if this is anything to do with uh, if this is being used for those private those private networks that formed in Mexico amongst the drug cartels. I wouldn't say that I'd know if they're on the customer list, <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got their number, we can certainly call them. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> because apparently uh, the the, uh, the army over there have been cleaning those breaks up. Uh, with these private little networks based on this sort of thing. Yeah. It could well be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, this, this concept is, is not a new one. Um, the software's all open. Um, typically, I think it's all about packaging it. And, you know, if you've got the mic, you wouldn't buy this. You'd maybe roll your own or buy something commercial. But this is for communities where $40 or $80 is a big deal. And we can save money. And where we can potentially save a lot of money on telephony costs. Um, you know, if there's a disaster and we have to throw these things to get connectivity between a small campus or across a town, that's when these things will will be worth their weight in gold. Because everyone knows how to use a telephone. Mm. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can think like earthquakes in Haiti and all that. Something like this would just throw it out there for whatever NGOs turn up would just be great until other services are restored. Just something very basic. Anyone can use. Put a sticker on it and say, it's 22, dull, something else. And away you go. So hey guys, that's it. Oh, this is a little bit of a view. This one doesn't get bigger, but that's a bit of a view of the solar setup they've got uh, and some of the deployments. So it's pretty cool to see. And this is being done by a small computer shop. So. I think I read that there's a solar regulator built into the thing as well. Yeah, so this, this into, little box that, there yeah. is yeah, it's a little commercial package that comes with a solar panel battery. I think it's a mob out of the UK that do it. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's made for developing areas where you just need some basic telephony, or sorry, power to either power telephony or even house lights. Mm. Um, some of the examples they give there, people trek quite a while with their mobile to portable charging stations because they've got no power at home and everyone has a mobile. So they use these things to power the mobiles at home or a basic little LED light that will let them read all night mm. without burning expensive kerosene. Yeah, I'm thinking we might grab, I might grab one of these to play around with. Um, to see if we can use it for digipeters and stuff. I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm more worried about the buying. I'm worried about how much it costs to ship. Yeah. Yeah. So you need sand's battery. Yeah. yeah. So you need to find one in Hong Kong with free shipping. Yeah, with free shipping. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a dodgy knockoff. <laughs> yeah. It's only 12 holes. What could go wrong? <laughs> Boom. Um, yeah, or, or we might yeah, get bits of one and finish it ourselves. Or Again, I like the idea of 
pre-packaged, not commercial but commercial, because it means that you could potentially buy 100 of them. Um, I really like supporting those sort of projects. And the cool thing about these guys giving it, shipping it with little lights as well, I think that's really cool. And little USB for the mobile phones charging as well, so that's pretty much what the market's for. So that's it guys, um, we'll leave the stuff here for a little while if people want to play around with it. Um, there's numbers on all the phones, so if you pick up a phone you can dial another one just by hitting the number that's written um, on one of the other ones. Unfortunately sort of since this idea. guy does pulse dialing, not supported, but it can receive calls, just can't make them. And it does sound pretty good when it rings. Pretty old school. That was the segue that you were meant to be putting in. What? what? <laughs> You're supposed to prep me on this. Actually this one does sound pretty cool. Which one was this one? This was, uh, yeah. 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 The 80s is ringing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, thanks very much. Cheers.